He was probably the most important dealer in the United States after World War II. He was just everywhere. He was involved with every major museum. He knew every director. He was probably the most well-connected person I ever met. You did have a so certain kind of feeling when you were with him that it was an opportunity that was special to be with someone like him. He was really kind of a maverick and fascinating at the same time. He was one of the most active, aggressive, creative dealers there was. And at the same time as doing that, he constantly was buying things which he didn't sell and kept at home. And so many of the pictures that we are going to be selling are things he bought in 1979 or 1980 and has had ever since. He, he called himself a collector in dealer's clothing, and that, that's what he was. He really was a true collector. Uh, he, he would, yes, sell from time to time. But when I went to see his house, I, it was like a mini museum. You know, it was, at the time, there was nothing like it. It was astonishing. I saw there Van Goghs and all kinds of incredible paintings. Apparently, he bought his first piece of art at the age of 12. It's kind of unusual to be a collector that early. And he always, apparently, was a co collector. He saw artists like Oitzeval, like Blomart, like Greenberg, that whole Northern Mannerist school that no one was looking at. And he bought some great ones at the time when they came up, and no one was thinking about it. But he understood quality, and he understood that these artists were visionary and that they were great. Probably in this sale that we're having, there are two artists that were probably amongst Richard's favorites. The first was uh, Richard Parks Bonington, who was an English painter who died super young. Fortunately, he left us a body of work and he was a beautiful and brilliant artist. We had quite a number of paintings by this very rare and important English early 19th century painter. The other artist there was Max Beckmann, who's a 20th century painter. He, he would pick artists that nobody was not on the highlight of anybody's list, like Beckman. There are two Beckmans in the exhibition. One is a quarry outside Munich, where Beckman possibly hid at one time, or at least he, he went into this quarry to make paintings. And if you wanted a Beckman, you had to go to Richard Feigen to get one. Well, there are quite a number of pictures which I like a lot. As I said, the Bonington of Venice is the one. I took it out of the frame the other day. It's behind glass to protect it. And I, I, my knees got weak. It's so beautiful. It's in perfect state. It's just an extraordinary object. There's also another painting by Bonington um, called La Ricci. I had heard of La Ricci before this. It's a, it's a coastal town near Genoa on the western coast of Italy. Bonington went there with his best friend, a man named Baron Rivet. And Rivet's in that painting, in the lower left-hand side. You look very carefully, he's sitting there, painting the same view, or painting a watercolor of the exact same view that you see. The blues are just the perfect color blue for the sky, for the, for the water, the grays on the rocks. The tonality is unbelievable. So it's, it's a very broad vision of art history. You have things from the early 1300s, right on through to the mid 20th century. Most areas are somehow represented. He constantly collected things that interested him. Richard had criteria. He would always say, never buy an artist who looks in the rear view mirror. Don't buy anyone who looks backward. Look for innovation. And he would see innovation. And I think people just admired him and admired his knowledge and admired the breadth of his interests and admired the apartments they were invited to filled with art. You know, he was something a little different than your normal art dealer.